to the fourth GREX webinar. Uh, I'm Stephanie Thompson, and I'm going to just briefly talk a little bit about GREX. Uh, so many of you know, we are an international collaboration uh, that's transdisciplinary, and we've reached out as far as uh, 36 countries with 350 people as members. And what we really strive to do, part of our mission, is to develop effective and feasible strategies to promote exercise and physical activity for people with kidney disease so that we can improve health. And so when we discussed potential topics for today's webinar, there was a lot of discussion, but what we felt was that this topic uh, entitled, what are the exercise recommendations or what should they be for people living with kidney disease, was really consistent with our values. Thinking that in order to get people started or to understand how we can actualize the health benefits of exercise, we need to inform people on where to start. And certainly, as I'm sure some of our presenters, presenters will mention, um, specific recommendations for special populations is something we are familiar with, assuming that not everybody's the same and that uh, people may need different directions depending on where they are. So before we get going, just a few housekeeping issues. We will have the chance to ask questions at the end of um, the presentation by all three presenters. That'll be about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, as you go, if you think of questions, please put them in the chat. Dr. Bennett is gonna be uh, monitoring that and he'll uh, run the chat and direct them to the appropriate <coughs> individual who's speaking. Two, if you also just have questions in general that you want to throw out in the chat or ideas for future webinars, please enter those as well and we will take note. Um, and until then, if I could just ask you to keep your microphones on mute to lessen the background noise for the speakers, that would be fantastic. Thanks for joining us and we'll get started. I'll hand it over to you, Tom, to do the first introduction. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, Good evening or good morning, wherever you are, evening in the UK. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Daniel March. So um, I've known Dan for a couple of years now. Um, he previously worked as a researcher at the University of Leicester in the UK, um, primarily coordinating a research team to deliver the cycle HD exercise trial in people on dialysis, which many of you will know. Um, this enabled him to publish data around the efficacy and cost effectiveness of exercise during dialysis. After a short stint away, um, Dan rejoined the University of Leicester in May 2021 as a lecturer. And in this post, he leads a program of research in individuals with CKD and co-leads a module in cardiovascular and renal precision medicine. Dan was one of the co-lead authors um, on the recent UK clinical practice guidelines into lifestyle and physical activity. Um, and really appreciate you, Dan, joining us this evening. Um, and I'll hand it over to you to share your screen and uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you, Tom. And uh, nice to meet everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present uh, today at this Grex webinar. So if you just bear with me a second, I'll just share my slides. So I was asked to uh, just speak on what should the recommendations in regard to exercise for people living with CKD be. And as Tom mentioned, I think one of the reasons why I was asked to speak about this topic is that I was uh, one of the authors, along with other colleagues here in the UK, on the clinical practice guideline for exercise on lifestyle and chronic kidney disease. Uh, this is the first guideline of its kind within the UK, um, and it was badged by the Renal Association. So what were the, uh, the recommendations that we made? So we looked at three different uh, CKD populations. So first of all, non dialysis CKD individuals, and then also individuals with CKD receiving hemodialysis. And lastly, those individuals who'd receive a transplant. So the transplantation population. So all the recommendations, there was a common theme running through these recommendations. So we recommended that uh, those individuals with CKD should be encouraged to access, sorry, should be encouraged um, 
to meet these uh, guidelines and the guidelines or the recommendations that we made, uh, we recommended that non diasis CKD patients, so that's the first population, should follow the UK Chief Medical Officer's Physical Activity Guideline. And that means that these patients should aim to accumulate 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity. So moderate physical activity means uh, is between three to six METs or metabolic equivalent of task and vigorous activity is six METs and above. So three METs, if you think of it, uh, or another way to uh, explain that would be a brisk walk, whereas vigorous activity or six METs is a light jog. So that was for the non diatis CKD population. So those with stages one to five. And similarly for the diatis population, we recommended that physical and uh, physical activity and exercise should be encouraged. And there was no contraindications to that. And we also recommended this 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, 75 minutes of vigorous or a mixture of both. Uh, and similar recommendations were made for the transplantation population. And we were asked to grade those recommendations and they were graded for each of these CKD populations as either a 1B, which means a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence, or a strong or 1C, which is a strong recommendation with low quality evidence. However, there was a caveat, if you like, uh, and this was a theme that was running throughout the guideline. So I've just been through and picked out a few parts um, where we made uh, some further recommendations. So we suggested that all individuals should work towards these physical activity levels. So these levels are just a name. There are no absolute thresholds, and we acknowledge that benefits are likely to be realized at lower levels. Um, I've just picked out a part from the transplantation section. So we, we said that these patients should aim um, to break up uh, sedentary, um, sorry, sorry, periods when they're sedentary um, and break up that with light or long periods of inactivity with light physical activity. Um, and then for the hemodiasis population, we know that these, uh, the hemodiasis population is particularly sedentary. So we said that even small modifications or small increases in physical activity was likely to be beneficial for these individuals. So really uh, the takeaway message from this slide is something is better than nothing. And as I said, this was based on the UK Chief Medical Officer's Physical Activity Guidelines. This is well established, this 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous activity. But perhaps more importantly, this also followed the same guideline as the uh, KDIGO 2012 Clinical Practice Guideline. So that's over 10 years old now, and they made similar um, similar recommendations. So where does so this 150 minutes? So there's been quite a few long uh, longitudinal cohort studies that have demonstrated the benefits of 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight this study. So uh, it's just important to point out that this is from the general population. Uh, so this study was published last year and they looked at 16,000 uh, 16, adults and they um, they followed them up. So they, they were asked to self-report physical activity first in 1986, and then they were followed. So their physical activity levels were then reported or updated every two years. And then their medium follow-up was 26 years. Um, so if you look at the table to the right here, um, so this top table shows levels, uh, weekly levels of moderate physical activity. Um, and this column here at the left, this is the 150 minutes um, to 224 and then 225 to 300 minutes per week. So when individuals met these levels, they got around a 20% reduction in all cause mortality. And similarly for cardiovascular mortality, so death due to um, cardiovascular disease, this 150 minutes was also associated with around about a 20% reduction in mortality. It was only when they reached those levels that they got this 20% reduction. So previously, many of the criticisms for recommending 150 minutes to the CKD population has been based, and I understand this, has been because this data is based on uh, data from the general population rather than the CKD population specifically. Um, 
But what we do know about the CKD population compared to the general population is they're more inactive. And this was shown from, I picked out this study from 2015. Um, so this pie chart, the bottom pie chart was the CKD individuals in the study and around just over 40% were sedentary. And when they compared this to the general population, uh, around 35% were sedentary. So CKD, those individuals with CKD are more inactive compared to the general population. So on this figure here on the right, this is uh, data from, from here at, in less than the UK. And what this shows is that as CKD progresses, then individuals become more inactive uh, with the most active CKD population being the, uh, the hemodialysis population. Um, when patients are transplanted, they, their activity levels reflect the activity levels of those with early stages CKD. So individuals with CKD are more inactive compared to the general population. And as disease progressive, uh, progresses, um, physical inactivity decreases. So this, uh, this study was actually, um, is another study from last year, um, and it was published after the guidelines, but really it does back up the, uh, the recommendations that were made in the guidelines. Um, so this is from a population, this is 4,000 individuals with an estimated GFR between 20 and 70. So it doesn't include those individuals with end-stage kidney disease and they self-reported phys physical activity. And that was once every two years for those who were 65 and above, and annually for those, sorry, uh, twice a year for those who were younger than 65, and annually for those who were older. And they looked at their outcomes were atherosclerotic events, heart failure, all-cause death, and cardiovascular events. Um, and first of all, the figure on the left. So they split the, uh, the population into quartiles um, based on their uh, moderate uh, physical activity levels. And they looked at all cause death and cardiovascular death. And what they reported is those who were least active, so the most sedentary, had the biggest risk of all cause and cardiovascular death. And then as those individuals with CKD became more active, their risk decreased of both all cause and cardiovascular death. Um, here to the figure on the right, so they specifically looked at, they split the, the individuals in this study into three groups. They split into those who were inactive, those who were active but not meeting the 150 minutes of physical activity, and those who were active and meeting the 150 minutes. And what they found is that if patients were active but did not meet this 150 minutes, their all-cause and cardiovascular death risk was decreased. But however, if they met the 150 minutes, so the activity levels that we recommended in the guideline, this significantly reduced both all-cause and cardiovascular death. So this really does support the recommendation of 150 minutes of physical activity, specifically in the CKD population. So as I said, that study didn't include individuals with end-stage kidney disease. Um, so I've picked out a study uh, from 2010, which looked at the DOPS data. And this was data for individuals with end-stage kidney disease receiving dialysis treatment. And this was with 20,000 individuals. And they were asked to self-report, how often do you exercise during your leisure time? And then they followed them up for just less than two years. Uh, what's striking about this data is that over half of these individuals reported exercising never or less than once a week. But what they did report is those individuals re who reported exercising two to three times or four to five times a week, their reduction or their risk of mortality was reduced by about 30% compared to the, um, th their control group as well. Um, Interestingly, those individuals who reported exercising more than that, so this six to seven times a week group, there was only um, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a further benefit to these extra um, levels of physical activity. However, it's important to, to mention that they didn't report, so they just report frequency of activity. They didn't report duration or intensity. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of um, data from randomized controlled trials um, in the DARSIS population, because we know this that this CKD subpopulation is particularly inactive. 
So this study reported last year, um, and this was follow-up data from a randomized controlled trial. So the original randomized controlled trial, I'm sure many are familiar with it, it was the EXCITE trial. And they asked, that, so it was a six month program of walk-in and the levels, um, or rather the program, you might, um, as you can see, was quite light. So it was three 10 minute sessions per week. So only 30 minutes per week of physical activity or walking. So that's significantly lower than the, uh, the levels that we recommend in the guideline. So the primary trial showed that this, these levels improve physical function and some components of quality of life. So 227 participants reached the end of the six month uh, period of the trial, and then they were followed up for a further 30 months. So you had 104 individuals in the exercise group, so the 30 minutes per week of walking, and then you had 123 individuals in the control group. And then they looked at hospitalizations and death. So it was a combined endpoint for 30 months. But it's important to state that this trial wasn't powered for these outcomes. Um, so it was powered for physical function. But, it, but this sort of post-trial follow-up did show some interesting results. So for this combined endpoint end of hospitalization and death, those in the exercise group had a 30% reduction compared to those in the control group. So over 13 months, there was a 30% reduction in hospital, hospitalization and death after the exercise intervention. Um, but it's important to mention when they looked at death on its own, there wasn't any difference between the groups. And just to highlight, as Tom mentioned, I was involved in the Cycle HD study here at Leicester. So this was an intradialytic, intradialytic exercise study. So this was some gentle cycling during the DARSIS treatment. So this was a study of 130 patients. So 65 were randomized to standard care and intradialytic cycling. So the cycling intervention was 30 minutes during every dialysis session per week. So 90 minutes of exercise per week, which is also below the guideline um, and standard care, which was just usual care. And what we found um, is in the exercise group, after six months of this exercise program, we saw uh, a reduction in left ventricular mass and some other cardiovascular benefits. So we do have a mechanism through which physical activity to, can improve outcome in these patients in, the, in this dialysis cohort. So just some takeaways from my presentation today. So individuals with chronic kidney disease should aim for 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity these benefits can be achieved via 75 min minutes of vigorous activity. And this is based on both evidence in the general population, but perhaps more importantly in the CKD population. Um, so such levels are associated with a reduction in both all cause and cardiovascular mortality. For individuals who can't meet these levels, so particularly the hemodiasis population, because we know they're more, uh, they're more sedentary than those with early stages CKD, then lower levels of physical activity are likely to be beneficial. So I showed you two studies which show benefits after 10 and 30 minutes, three times per week. Um, and some people, and I understand this argument, some people might say, well, why have you recommended 150 minutes of moderate activity if you've, if you've seen benefits with um, lower levels of activity? And as I said, I do understand that, but both in the CKD early stage population and the general population, we know that if you meet 150 minutes, then you're likely to get more benefit than lower than lower levels. And as I said, this is a name. So um, we don't really want to, you know, if, if patients do meet, meet this 150 minutes, they're likely to see more benefit than with, with lower levels of activity. And more importantly, there doesn't appear to be a threshold um, so the more active you are, the more benefit you're likely to uh, to get. So these guidelines are clear, easily understood, and more importantly, they're evidence-based. So just a few areas where I think we need further understanding. I believe there may still be need for a properly powered randomized control trial investigating increased levels of physical activity on car cardiovascular and all cause mortality in the CKD population. This trial, I think it would be very, very difficult to do, um, but it's, it's certainly a challenge. Because And as it, this sort of second point follows up on that point, so the majority of evidence comes from longitudinal cohort studies. 
Um, hence why we grade this, we made the strong recommendation that this evidence was graded as moderate or low quality. I think individuals should be offered choices to become more physically active. I don't think it matters how patients become more physically active. It's just that they, they be sort of meet, try and meet these levels because they will get this benefit. Um, so they should be offered choices, but it's important that any choices, interventions and strategies are evidence-based. And we know that methods to implement program, programs of exercise should be a priority. So for example, with the Cycle HD study, we showed that intradialectic cycling was beneficial for cardiovascular health, but the majority of patients, certainly in the UK, don't get access to intradialectic cycling programs. So we need to look at how we can uh, implement programs of exercise or physical activity. Just lastly, um, when we're talking to patients and individuals, when we look at this image on the left, when we talk about physical activity, Many people think of structured exercise, perhaps in a gym setting, um, but moderate physical activity, as I said, it's just brisk walking, or it can be just brisk walking. There can be other options. So it could be a brisk walk in the park. Um, and generally we know that in our environments make it difficult to be physically active. So even small changes such as taking the stairs instead of the lift or the elevator, getting off the bus stop at an earlier stop, so just really trying to incorporate physical activity into our everyday lives, I think um, will help individuals meet that 150 minutes. So thank you for listening. And my last slide, so my contact details are there if anybody would like to get in contact with myself. And just my last, last slide is uh, finishing on the guidelines. So back, back where we started at the beginning of the presentation. So uh, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you very much to Dr. Daniel March for that talk. It's very interesting and a good reminder that exercise can be, you know, brisk walk and can be incorporated in small ways throughout your day. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Emily Ford and I am the Grex project manager and I have the honor of introducing our second speaker, Dr. Dev Jagathison, who is a consultant nephrologist at Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane, Australia and a lecturer and PhD candidate at the University of Queensland. His research interests include physical fitness in people with kidney disease, patient-centered care, and the interplay between cardiovascular and kidney disease. Really appreciate you joining us today and looking forward to your talk. I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you, Emily. I trust you can see me forwarding through the slides now. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity and, and uh, good morning from, from Brisbane uh, to all. Um, so, so my um, uh, brief was really to uh, provide a clinical perspective on, on recommendations and following on from, from Daniel's excellent um, uh, talk. It's really, I guess, uh, my aim is to talk at a perhaps a more individual um, patient level and, and to share some of my thoughts um, with regards to how well, I guess how we, we go about doing that in, in, in the clinic. Um, so this is the outline of, of what I'd like to cover and hopefully I'll get that get through this in, in the allocated time frame. So to start, I think it's very, very important um, as nephrologists that, that we um, educate our patients about exercise very early in the patient journey. Uh, patients need to know that, that kidney disease is unique in its, um, particularly with its associations with sarcopenia, functional decline, and of course, as an independent cardiovascular risk factor. At a patient level, um, you know, the majority of patients are actually, you know, they feel empowered um, to discuss and talk about this because compared to other aspects of their healthcare, this is actually a modifiable component, um, much like diet and sleep and, and perhaps their mental health aspects are there. So, and, and really exercise or the discussion about exercise is, is really an adjunct to clinical care. Um, and when we talk about um, exercise and, and individual goals and motivations, it gives us as clinicians an opportunity to educate ourselves about the patient and not just their medical, but also their psychosocial. Um, and when I say goals, it's not just exercise, it's also their life and perhaps their work, family goals as well. Um, and very early in the piece, it's important to, to address and, and, and speak to them about their perceived barriers um, for physical activity and exercise. 
clearly we have uh, you know a diverse group of patients so it's and you know they all have differing baseline fitness levels as well so we need to know that before we can tailor the recommendations accordingly and as with any um, aspect of, of, of medicine you know the more individualized and, and patient appropriate the, the program is uh, I believe the more likely it is to improve you know adherence with with said you know, intervention or program so speaking about motivators and barriers so um, this um, it was a, it was a summary of a qualitative paper um, done by Clark et al and reported in 2015 and and they did a qualitative study um, in non uh, CK sorry non-dialysis CKD patients where they did focus groups and interviews. And, and there's some helpful sub um, categories here. So for motivators, um, uh, patients in this study felt that there were, you know, the perceived benefits of exercise were motivating. So cardiovascular overall and mental um, health aspects. Um, there was also the social benefits. So interaction, particularly in group um, and exercise settings. And they were more likely to exercise if they had supportive caregivers as well. Um, but a lot of focus was also on the personal change um, that is the, the accountability, the sense of achievement, particularly if they've achieved progressive improvements with their exercise. And as I mentioned, you know, there's the modifiable aspect of health uh, with, with, with um, fitness as well. And, and clearly if they'd had a previous positive experience with exercise, they were more likely to be motivated. Now on the barrier side, um, there were certainly a lot of personal barriers. So fear, fatigue, comorbidities, um, certainly we, we hear that a lot in our, in our clinics, um, but also social barriers, um, particularly or the potential impact it may have on their support personnel or, or caregivers, particularly if they're having to take them, you know, outside of home for exercise sessions, as an example. But there's also the physical environment, whether access, cost, inconvenience, which, I mean, these are barriers outside of, uh, you know, people living with kidney disease as well. And then lastly, if they've had a previous negative experience with exercise, this is a perceived barrier. So I put this in there because I think um, nephrologists need to both understand and also uh, broach these particular uh, you know, goals and motivators and barriers with patients early in that, in that journey. I think exercise needs to be outcome driven. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've just said, you know, exercise, you know, takes, takes time and potentially that of others. It's potentially expensive, risky, painful, inconvenient, not as simple as taking a pill. So the outcomes really do have to be worth it for both the patient and the caregivers. And, and you know, we can't talk about outcomes um, without mentioning uh, the Song uh, Nephrology Group. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sure most of the, the, the audience have heard of Song, but it stands for Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology. And, and really, they have multiple work groups, typically split by stage of kidney disease, where they have key stakeholders, including patients, caregivers, clinicians, and, and policymakers that come together to determine what, what they feel are the, the, the important outcomes that particularly should be reported in in, um, in trials and, and should be studied in research. Um, and, and this is both, both to make the research more meaningful and patient-centered, but also um, you know, to minimize research waste. So this schema has really brought together what I feel are the, um, the, the, the outcomes that are related to exercise or potentially mitigated by exercise. And you see here PD, HD, and kidney transplant. And there's a Venn diagram, and you can read those outcomes uh, for yourselves. But I, I include this to say that, you know, individual patients may have different outcomes that they want to achieve. And, and although cardiovascular disease, uh, mortality, hospitalization, you know, these, these ones in the center, I mean, these are core outcomes that, that are relevant for all groups. Um, it, it, there, there might be more than that. Um, it, it may have further goals and, and some of those we'll, we'll touch on a bit later and we'll come back to this. But again, it's important before we prescribe or advise exercise, we need to be very clear on what their goals and outcomes are. So moving on to recommendations, which is sort of the brief of this talk. And as we've, we've already seen from, from Daniel's presentation, really um, any form of aerobic resistance or combined exercise training or program can improve fitness. And, and arguably the, the, the lower the fitness level at baseline, the more bang for buck one achieves by, by doing exercise. But I believe that the best exercise is really the one that is safe challenging, acceptable, and goal-oriented. So to go through these in turn, I mean, from a safety perspective, the exercise or exercises or the program needs to factor in the patient's comorbidities uh, and also the safety of their home or, or exercise environment. Uh, it should be challenging uh, and it should be appropriate based on their baseline fitness um, with ease and feasibility of incrementing uh, the level of difficulty, uh, whatever the program that is. Uh, and it needs to be acceptable. So convenience, cost, duration, location needs to be 
um, need to be considered. And I mean, you could come up with a, a beautiful scientifically validated evidence-based program, but if it's not acceptable to the patient, well, it's it's not, you know, and the caregiver, I must say, um, it's not, you know, going to happen. Um, and then last but not least, it should be goal-oriented, and, and we'll touch on this in a moment. Now, I do apologise for this this busy busy table, but I did want to share it because. You know, I, I'm, I'm a nephrologist and I'm interested in exercise, but I don't have an exercise physiology background. And um, certainly when I was going through the, you know, the, the various trials, it honestly, I was a bit confused um, by the, particularly the type of uh, assessment methods that we used in the study. So I, I needed a framework to help me understand fitness. And so I wanted to share this. This is one model. This is one framework that looks at five domains of physical fitness, namely aerobic fitness, exercise capacity, neuromuscular fitness, body composition, and other physiological and metabolic. And, you know, typically, you know, you would read a study, they would say that this intervention improves strength, and they would use, uh, they would use the assessment method of hand grip strength, whereas another study would look at 30 second sit to stand test, or another study would look at one repetition maximum. So, so for me, I, I needed to understand why they were using different assessment methods and, a, and a, perhaps a framework. So I just wanted to share that. But really for today's talk, I wanted to focus on that last column, which refers to patient relevance and trying to link in some of the outcomes that the Song work group has done. And, and here, um, if I can just take an example, I mean, I believe that the domains of exercise capacity and neuromuscular fitness are the ones that, that are most relevant, um, uh, broadly speaking, for our, our kidney disease cohort. So for example, you know, if you take a hemodialysis patient, who, you know, their, their priorities, according to the Song Workgroup, ability to travel, mobility, ability to work, you know, these particular outcomes and, and, and these components that are deemed relevant for these patients really relate to the domain of exercise capacity. So therefore, prescribing interventions and exercises or programs that improve traits of, of this fitness uh, domain. Um, so for example, you know, test the interventions that improve um, performance on the six minute walk test or the incremental shuttle walk test, for example, may be more likely to actually achieve these patient important outcomes. And, and equally, um, you know, with regards to uh, neuromuscular fitness, which is a big component for our patients. So, you know, muscle weakness, um, potentially, you know, um, hospitalization, ability to work again, um, can really relate to neuromuscular fitness domain. And again, prescribing activities that that work on strength, strength endurance power, for example, might allow patients to, to you know, achieve those outcomes more, more specifically. So, so I just wanted to share the framework which has helped me sort of understand and, and particularly, you know, I guess, um, individualize the, the, the intervention according to the patient's goals. So in an ideal world, uh, I think that the framework um, to follow would be, you know, firstly, to establish the exercise and fitness goals for the patient. Secondly, to assess their baseline fitness as well as their safety to perform uh, the exercise. Um, thirdly, to prescribe evidence-based interventions. Fourthly, to ensure clear lines of safety reporting and monitoring. And, and that clearly needs to be a two-way line of communication. And then last but not least is to regularly review their, their progress and appropriately increment the, the exercise um, you know, according to that. Now, that is very much in an ideal world. And, and to, to achieve this, you know, we really need an exercise dream team, um, which, which really as a minimum um, needs to involve a physician, an exercise professional, nurse, occupational therapist and dietitian. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, where, where I practice and from my understanding, the majority of Australia, um, you know, we don't have exercise um, professionals that form a routine part of our um, nephrology care or departments. Um, so really forming this exercise multidisciplinary team is very much, you know, a, 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 well, it's a pipe dream at the moment. And hopefully in years to come, this will be clearly established. And really, you could argue that an exercise MDT is important for, for every patient, but, but particularly those that are the sedentary, older, comorbid, maybe frail patients, because arguably, well, they are the more high risk, I believe, for, for doing exercise uh, without, you know, multidisciplinary input and thought. But also, on the other hand, as mentioned earlier, I think you get the most bang for buck um, with, with, their, um, with them actually engaging in, in physical activity and, a, and an individualized exercise program. Now, sorry, no, okay. Um, now, outside of, of this particular MDT model, um, uh, you know, as I say, that this is this is wishful thinking and, and, and something that 
that you know we aim towards. I'm, I'm sure there are people perhaps in this in this meeting in this forum that that do have these um, programs in place, and it'd be great to hear from them sort of later uh, later on as well as to as to how they go go about doing it. Now, apart from that, what I guess I wanted to also talk about is is you know it's a recommendations talk, and although we can't generalize. Um, uh, I did want to share some, some thoughts about um, the exercises that you know, I do commonly prescribe uh, for the right patient. So, so walking, we, we spoke briefly about this and Daniel mentioned this as well. So one of my thoughts, I mean, I think, you know, it's safe um, for almost everyone um, can be done uh, at low intensity and it can be made challenging as well. You can increment through speed, distance and perhaps on inclines. Um, it's uh, accepted by, by most patients, convenient, free, can really be done anywhere. Um, and, and you do get anticipated improvements in uh, particular the domains of exercise capacity, uh, power, which is the domain of neuromuscular fitness, as well as cognitive function, to, to name a few. I mean, there are so many more, but, but just to illustrate the fact that these are the goals that, you know, when we talk to patients, that this, you know, is one of the things that they want to hear as to what, what am I actually hoping to improve. And so just to share that these are some of the outcomes of interest with regards to walking. Uh, the next um, well, step up, uh, part, part of the pun, is with uh, stair climbing. Um, so again, it's safe for, for most patients and, and it can be done indoors. Um, it's slightly more challenging perhaps than walking, but again, you can increment through speed, duration, the number of repetitions you do. Um, it's um, generally free. Um, I put convenient and home-based in, in brackets because, I mean, that depends uh, if they have stairs at home, for example. Um, and, and here you have anticipated improvements in exercise capacity, lower limb strength and strength endurance, to, to name a few. And again, um, uh, you know, patients can, uh, can hope that with, with increments in this, that these are the domains of fitness that they may hope to improve as well. Uh, next up is, is cycling and swimming. Um, now here, uh, I think, personally, I, I feel uncomfortable prescribing it unless they have some degree of supervision, either uh, an able sort of caregiver or, or loved one at home or an exercise professional, particularly with swimming. Um, but, but we know from, from research that it is you know, safe uh, to, to perform uh, across, um, at least in a research environment. Um, and it is challenging. You can increment, again, distance, duration. And you know, if it's an exercise bike, for example, you can turn up the, the resistance there as well. Um, compared to walking and stair climbing, um, in my experience is it's, it's less acceptable for, for the general population uh, of patients we see because it's not always free, convenient or home-based. Uh, not everyone has an exercise bike or a pool at home, for example. Um, but still for the right patient, um, you know, is, is appropriate advice, I think. And, and here, because it's I, I think generally more intense than the other two activities, um, you, you have anticipated improvements across most fitness domains. And, and we certainly have um, evidence in mostly the non tddps cohorts to suggest that, you know, it does help across most domains. And then last but not least, and I think, you know, arguably the gold standard it is a combined training program that involves aerobic resistance and a flexibility component to it. And, um, you know, although it's probably the most balanced, uh, the, the other side is that it's the one that requires most MDT supervision um, naturally. And, and again, we have a handful of patients that are, that are fortunate enough to pay for, for private exercise physiologists, for example. And, and with for them, you know, we're able to achieve fairly, you know, I mean, it's a productive and fairly effective um, uh, goal-oriented um, uh, treatment programs for them, whereby we, we sort of have an unofficial MDT in, in that instance, and then there's dialogue to ensure that it's still safe and effective. Um, again, uh, good research uh, to suggest that at least in the, uh, in the research setting that it is safe um, when it's when it's supervised. It's but but that's also sort of a downside that you do need that supervision and and the cost and time that goes with that. By nature is challenging. You can have a guided and graded progressive resistance and endurance program. Um, and, um, but the acceptability um, is probably the least because it's not necessarily for, for every patient. Um, the, as I mentioned there, costs, convenience, the location are all different to perhaps what we've discussed um, uh, in you know, the last three exercises. Um, but of, of all of them, I, I think you get the most um, uh, improvements across you know, all, all fitness domains by having a program that encompasses different, um, you know, these different domains of fitness. Um, so concluding remarks, um, I, I think uh, clinicians, I mean, nephrologists, um, you know, should discuss the role of exercise very early uh, for, for patients. 
Uh, we know from, you know, as with any lifestyle intervention, when, when mentioned and discussed by uh, their specialist, it's far more likely to, for the patients and their caregivers to, to take that on as, as advice. And that's just human nature and, and I guess behavioral science that goes behind that. Um, we need to tailor recommendations per individual fitness levels and their goals. Uh, the best exercise is one that's safe, challenging, acceptable and goal oriented. The more comorbid and frail patients are really the ones that we, we, we need that MDT support and where there is certainly lacking where, where I practice. And, and really, you know, the future is, you know, towards having an exercise MDT for all of our, um, you know, patients across the spectrum of kidney disease. Um, now, just to finish, I'll, I'll just pop this, um, this table on just to say that um, I've, I've added in the recommendations column here for, for your review later. And I, I mean, I believe that, again, this provides sort of a domain based approach to, to how we might recommend the type of exercise, um, you know, in addition to, to highlighting the time and, and you know, um, the advice on how much physical activity one needs to do in, in, in a week or, you know, um, in a month, um, I think this hopefully allows us to provide a little bit more specific advice um, based on what the individual goals are. So, so with that, I'll, I'll finish and, and I guess, um, you know, happy to take questions um, at the end. So thank you all for listening and the opportunity. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dev, for sharing your uh, nephrologist perspective. And we will now move to our next speaker. Uh, that will share the patient perspective. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce on behalf of the Grex committee, Wilson Du, also known as the renal warrior, a kidney patient with on dialysis for over five years before receiving his kidney transplant last year. And during his time on dialysis, he managed to, to lose over 130 pounds doing various types of physical activities. Uh, including competitions such as riding his bike 600 miles down the coast of California, impressive Olympic distance triathlon, as well as various other competitions. He now dedicates his life to helping other patients through his gym, uh, the Mission HQ in Alameda, California. So, Wilson, thank you very much, and I'll end over to you. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. Uh, hi, everybody. It's it's an honor to be in this panel. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Merch and Dr. Jake Atkinson, you both hit it uh, the nail right on the uh, on the head. There, you reaffirmed uh, everything that um, I'll be talking about from a clinical standpoint. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, the, uh, Dr. March, you're talking about the the physical aspect of things, and Dr. Jake Atkinson, you were speaking a lot about the the mental aspect of things, which was Absolutely, everything they said, absolutely true. Um, again, my story started, I, I've always been a big guy all my life. I'm, I'm talking well over 300 pounds in my adult life. Um, that's what led into the kidney disease. And, and, you know, I always avoided the doctor because I knew I was overweight. I knew I wasn't living a healthy lifestyle until one day, boom, it caught up to me, right? Um, one day I went into the emergency room uh, for some gout pains. And when I was in the ER, they pulled out some labs and uh, not only did they figure it was gout, they told me I had stage five end stage renal disease. That was the first time I've ever heard of kidney disease. And it sounds like, no, no problem. Just go ahead and fix it. Whether you want to give me some pills, surgery, whatever, fix it. I got to get, get on with my life again. And that's when they said, I'm sorry, Wilson, that's not the case. You're not going back to work. You're not doing all those things because your life is about to completely change. Uh, you're going to have to go on something called dialysis. And when they explained that to me, it was my life turned upside down, got absolutely hit by a freight train. Um, there had to be another way. I was fighting with my doctor telling him, there's got to be another way. We got to be able to do something else. And that's when he said, yeah, there is another way. There's a kidney transplant. But unfortunately, you won't qualify due to your weight. At the time of diagnosis, I was 315 pounds. And he said, well, you know, in order for you to even be looked at or be evaluated to even qualify to, to even get it, entertain a transplant, we need you to lose 100 pounds. And coming from a guy that's been well over 300 pounds all my life, telling me to lose 100 pounds is like telling me to lose 1,000 pounds. On top of that, my blood pressure through the roof um, was very sick. Gout couldn't walk. Um, and so telling me to exercise, telling me to lose weight was absolutely impossible. Um, I would say that 
my life did got turned upside down. I was hospitalized for weeks. So, so much so that my muscles atrophied left me on a wheelchair when I was on dialysis. Uh, so much to the point where it was just, you know, I really had to make a decision whether I wanted to continue going on and quit and potentially just end everything or do I choose to fight? I remember specifically speaking with my doctor and he was just saying, you know, son, you're, 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 you're very sick. And so, um, you know, and it's very difficult for you to exercise right now. I would say just, you know, kind of get comfortable and, and go through dialysis. And hopefully one day if you get better, then we can work with you. But it was, it was kind of a grim outlook, pretty much telling me without telling me, you know, get comfortable. You're extremely sick. There's all sorts of other things going wrong with you that, um, you know, just kind of get comfortable and prepare for, you know, you may not survive that long. Well, anyways, uh, I remember just, you know, there's so much going on at the time and uh, I was completely broken, physically, mentally, spiritually broken. I was 34 years old at the time. Um, I remember coming home uh, from dialysis one day uh, and the transport would either drop me off either at the wheelchair or the bed. Wherever they would drop me, I would be there for the rest of the day because I couldn't really move. And as I contemplated whether or not I wanted to stick to dialysis or just kind of give it all up. Cause it, I mean, I was 34 years old, my career was flying high. And to tell me to just, my life was gonna be relegated to just this chair three to four days a week that I can't even move, that I, I'm, only, I'm only stuck at, the, at home. All my hopes and dreams at that moment, boom, crushed. But something inside of me kept on telling me to fight and it was gonna be hard. I couldn't walk, I couldn't move, 300 something pounds. And the journey to get, to lose hundred pounds, to even qualify, to even entertain the thought of transplant was nearly impossible. But when I did sit there, I, I contemplated it and I made the decision. I said, I was gonna choose life. I promised myself, you know what? You're already dead anyways, let's go ahead and fight this thing and give it hell and fight as hard as you can. Doesn't matter if it kills you, you still fight this. And that day I was on that wheelchair looking outside and I picked myself up. I got up off that wheelchair. I took my step. It was one of the most painful step I've ever taken in my life. The most painful step. And then another step. So much more pain, even more pain. And then another step. And then another step. And I got about 10 feet from my wheelchair to my front door. And I, I came back to the wheelchair. Actually, I walked back to the bed and I slept the rest of the day because I was so tired from walking that 10 feet walk. But I tell you what, I did that every single day. Every single day, 10 feet walk, 10 feet walk. And you know what? The body gets stronger. 10 feet after a couple of weeks became 15 feet. 15 feet became 20 feet. 20 feet became outside. Smell that fresh air. Oh my gosh, that was one of the best feelings. I had been outside in so long, smelt that air. And all of a sudden, going outside, going down the block, turned into down the street, down the street, it was to the mall. Then I remember walking my first mile. It took me 50 minutes, almost an hour to walk. It takes most people, what, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It took me more than double that with crutches and then after the threw away the crutches start walking with the cane and got a little bit stronger a little bit stronger so I could walk on my own I just kept on going and going I just kept on pushing it as far as I could go that was all I can do I remember just kept on doing it and doing it all of a sudden the mile became five miles six miles ten miles and then one day I said hey maybe I could jog a little bit I started jogging literally first time I jogged maybe 30 seconds out of breath but you know what i did that again every single day i use the same philosophy i did with walking and that 30 seconds became 40 seconds 40 seconds became a minute a minute became two minutes three minutes four minutes four. and i started running races where we're talking about you know doing 5ks 10ks eventually doing half marathons doing all of that and then one day i hopped on a bike hopped on a bike started going five miles 10 miles, 20 miles, 600 miles down the coast of California, all of this while on dialysis. And so 
I kept on moving. I didn't stop. And it wasn't to the point where, you know, I was super, uh, super sore, super exhausted. I just did what I could every single day. And I pushed it as far as I could. And I was tired. I stopped. And then when I felt the energy again, I kept on going and going. And I never stopped. Two years after I started the, that five feet, 10 feet walk, I had lost the weight. I had qualified for transplant. I lost 140 pounds or 100 pounds at that, at that moment. I qualified for transplant. 220, I went down to 315, down to about 220 pounds. And at that moment, I didn't want to stop. So I kept on going and going and going. And it, it, just, it just never stopped. I got down to about 180. I started training harder. I started doing all sorts of things. The Olympic distance triathlon. And how my story goes is that after... I, complete, I competed in all these events. I, I realized now I qualify for transplant and it was such an amazing journey to actually get to that point that while still on dialysis, I decided that I made a promise to God. I, I promised God that, you know, when I was in the nursing home, I said that if I ever got better, I would live a better life and I would dedicate myself to helping others. Uh, I, I, prom I made that promise. And so... As I lost the weight, as I qualified for transplant, I started an opportunity to open up a gym out here in my hometown, Alameda, California came about. And so the gym is the Mission HQ and our mission is to help others that are chronically ill live their best lives. And I, I'm here at the gym right now and I still train every day, but the gym's mission is, is to help train people. And so all the folks, chronic kidney disease. It was supposed to be just for chronic kidney disease. It was supposed to be for folks on dialysis. It was supposed to be for folks that are transplanted to come in to know that I've lost the weight, that I've exercised, that I started with a 10 feet walk, that I never exercised previously in my life. And here I am opening up a gym and that if I could do it, so can you. And all of a sudden I was getting a bunch of dialysis patients from my uh, dialysis clinic. And then it expanded over to cancer patients, uh, heart, uh, you know, heart patients, stroke victims, and everybody came here to actually, the, the class still goes on, we call it the warrior class. And so um, that class is designed just to help people build their confidence so that they can actually start working out so that they can walk a little bit every day. And so they know they're getting trained by somebody else who's actually already done it as well. So uh, as far as, you know, as of today, I, I've been transplanted. I was on dialysis for five and a half years, and I just received my transplant March 8th, uh, 2022 of last year. And, you know, what exercise means for me, it's, you know, it, I, I told you earlier, I was completely broken physically, mentally, spiritually. And what exercise did for me was a lot of things. Number one, it, you know, the obvious thing was the physical benefits of it losing the weight to be able to qualify for transplant. But along with that journey of that physical transformation came along, well, the physical transformation is a lot of what uh, Dr. Mar uh, Dr. March was talking about. And then you're looking at the mental aspect of it is what Dr. Jack Atheson was talking about. Not only did I change physically, I built my confidence to believe that I can conquer things. I, I, I never imagined in a million years as an adult that I can lose even 50 pounds. And here, I, here I, I am that I've lost 130, 140 pounds. So the confidence came about with that. Not only that, you know, exercise was, was the only calming thing for me. When I was in dialysis or when I was at home, I was sick, I was a dialysis patient, I was always tired. But when I was exercising, yes, the minute I started exercising, I was still tired. But I was like everybody else around me at the gym because they were tired too. And at that moment, that 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 mental clarity, that that whole just it, it became addictive because at that moment, while everybody was huffing and puffing, and so was I, I wasn't a patient at that time. I was just like everybody else. My philosophy back then was I, I go on the chair, I do dialysis, I'm going to be tired like all of us are. I, if I have, if you have CKD, you're constantly fatigued, you're tired. So you know what? I was going to go to the gym. I was going to work out and do the things that I could do, not overextend myself and go to the point where I couldn't walk. I just did what I could do. And with that, I'm still getting tired, but there's so much more benefits of being tired from that 
versus being tired from the dialysis chair. So I, at that moment, again, was just like everybody else. And that did so much, uh, so much for my mental clarity. Um, my message to everybody that, that's out there that's battling CKD is just, you know, you do what you can. It might be a 10 feet walk and you can do that every single day and your body will get stronger. Your mind will get stronger. If you can move an inch, you can move a mile. The mind, the body, the spirit is a magnificent thing and it will get better. It can get better if you allow it to get better. Um, I run my gym out right now over here uh, in Alameda, California. Again, our mission is to help uh, to help all those battling chronic illness, recovering from uh, uh, any type of illness. I help them get better. And it's not through, it's not just through the physical exercise. The physical exercise is just the confidence builder. We have we have people in hospice that say, that tell me, I refuse to die, but I will be in here in this water class till my last day. And they're sitting in their wheelchairs and just moving. And it's extremely inspiring. And so a lot of folks out there, the ones that are battling the CKD, remember, if you can move an inch, you can move a mile. You can certainly, if you can walk four or five steps, you can do that every single day until that four or five steps become six or seven steps. There's certainly something that you can always do. And with that, you if you continue to, to do that and you do that every single day, your confidence will get better. Your confidence, again, I can't say it enough, your confidence will get better so you can do more. Um, but yeah, I, I, it goes again, you know, uh, to what uh, both doctors uh, was saying earlier, uh, I wrote down, um, you know, something is better than nothing. And doing 25 minutes a day, wonderful you know talk talk about dr chigatison there's a lot of mental benefits from a lot of this there's even though there's barriers there's social barriers physical barriers you don't have to go to a gym you can walk at home you can sit in the chair and just stand up and sit down and you can do that however many times you can do it and just keep track of it and after you keep track of it try to increase that after you get a little bit stronger that just goes to his point about setting goals seeing what you can do and really just let your body do it, let your mind do it. And, you know, that'll help you live your best life while battling CKD. Um, so yeah, that that's my whole uh, take on exercise. And, and, and you know, uh, I just, again, want to preach a little bit every day goes a long way and you, you will get stronger. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilson. That was uh, incredibly inspiring. And yeah. um, it's great to have you on board. Um, I'd like to really thank you and Dan and, and Dev. It's been a it's been a great um, it's been a great hour. Um, we're going to push it out a little bit. Um, I've got permission from Emily to uh, to ask some questions, um, and hopefully Zoom won't cut us off. So um, that will be good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Benners. I'm one of the coordinators in G Rex, and I'm from Adelaide, Australia. Uh, there was a, a a really good question in the in the chat from uh, from Kerry Rubenfeld, and and probably Wilson. This is the best one for you, maybe. Um, beyond reduced cardiovascular and kidney function, um, how does someone track their fitness levels? Um, and in particular, the effectiveness of one's own physical activity program. What do you recommend for people, particularly with kidney disease, CKD, dialysis or transplant, to track them and to help that motivate them? Um, you know, uh, a, a big thing to help them track is uh, th there's uh, various apps. You want to create um, some type of, some create that baseline. Create that baseline in terms of you could, you know, I, I have most patients walk on the treadmill very slow, two miles an hour, and I see how far, how long they can go before they get tired. We're not pushing them to the, to the point of where exhaustion, we're walking to the point where they feel a little fatigued, they feel a little tired. Okay, that's their baseline. And if you write that down, even in a journal, you could track it with an app, a MyFitnessPal, a walking app. Uh, any of oh, my fitness pals for nutrition, by the way, but uh, if you look at like Under Armour has a, um, uh, a, a walking uh, tracker, I use an Apple watch, you can use a Fitbit and know where you're at. I remember on my journey I was doing, uh, I had a Fitbit and I walked one day uh, as far as I could. And I believe it was one day it was about 3000 steps. It wasn't that much. And doing 3000 steps, my, the game that I played in my mind was that I wrote it down, 3,000 steps this week, 
So the following week has to be minimum 3,001. So it didn't matter how much more I beat, I just needed to make it better. And some weeks, let's say I go from 3,000 to 3,001. The next week has to be 3,002, but I walk 4,000. So the following week has to be at least 4,001. And you keep on playing this game with you. I made up a bunch of little games to keep me entertained. Even in the dialysis clinic was, my goal was to lose one kilo a week. I was 300 some odd pounds, so that was very attainable. Now that included the exercise, that included the diet. Um, and it wasn't a drastic change of diet. It was just throw out some of the junk and replace, you know, one of the proteins instead of with processed foods, let's, let's, let's exchange that for some actual real meat, you know, something to that. Uh, and, and you, the, the transformation and the journey to fitness, to getting better, doesn't happen overnight. It happens with incremental changes so that it's long lasting. Hope that makes sense. Oh, that was great, Wilson. Uh, Tom has a question from Lester. Tom. Yeah, uh, thanks, Wilson. Uh, you've got a, fo a new follower on Instagram um, and your yeah. before and after photos are <laughs> unbelievable. My question is slightly related to kind of your Instagram page, to be honest. Uh, clearly, there's, you know, the exercise and all the physical activity is 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 great. But what about the diet aspect of this? Because I can clearly see that you've got your diet pretty nailed, it seems. Yeah. I mean, when you were on dialysis and stuff, how did how did you kind of balance that, the, the restrictions from the dialysis treatment, et cetera, with exercise? And how's that it kind of evolved now as you've had right. the transplant as you go forward? Right. No, that's that's an excellent question. Now, uh, you know, uh, exercise is one key component. But I, I think above all else for our, our health uh, inside our body, nutrition is a huge factor. Um, and I will tell you on my journey while on dialysis, I got in trouble many times by the doctors, especially during labs. Um, and you know, we, we kind of honed it down to what I could eat rather than what I couldn't eat. And we stuck within the parameters of that. And when you're dealing with something like CKD um, and you're on dialysis, you, you, you really have to ask yourself, you really have to ask yourself, uh, you know, what is the primary objective here? And, you know, and, and what, what happens if you fail or, or what is the end result of that? And, you know, for me, it was, it was ultimately I would die or I would not qualify for a transplant. So I kind of stuck with what I could eat. I stuck with a diet that was sustainable. Um, you know, and I have a superpower. My superpower is I don't mind eating the same thing all the time. And so I, I pretty much stuck to what I could eat to keep my phosphorus levels down. Obviously, when you're on dialysis, you can't load up on protein. Um, you're, you're very limited on certain things. I kept my portion portions very clear. And one of the biggest, um, the biggest contributors to nutrition is really preparing your food in advance. If you can prepare your food in advance, that is about 80, 90% of the game. When you're not hungry and you prepare food, you will prepare good nutritious food. If you're hungry, you're going to prepare all sorts of junk that you want at that moment. So preparing it is half the battle because if you put it in the refrigerator and it's time to eat, you're going to grab that. Otherwise, it goes bad. You're wasting money at that point. And it's very convenient. Just take it, pop it in the microwave and eat it. Um, so that's what I did while on dialysis. I'm very closely monitored by my nephrologist just because uh, I was... Um, uh, I, I was doing various uh, physical um, physical things. So they were very monitoring uh, my, my protein intake, my carb intake, and my phosphorus levels, my potassium, all that good stuff. So I was very lucky in that aspect. And that has evolved up to this point. I, I've been transplanted for about a year. I work with a uh, performance coach, Dr. Dwayne Jackson out in Canada, who is, um, he's a, uh, he coaches professional athletes. He coaches uh, a lot of celebrities. Um, and he's also received his kidney transplant a couple of years ago. Um, he was a tenure professor over at the University of Ottawa. And now we talk on a weekly basis. We go over labs. We see what we can do via, um, while I'm trying to perform, I'm, I'm currently trying to bodybuild while being a transplant patient, which is a very tricky thing. So uh, that has evolved into um, my meals now are, they don't vary. They're practically almost the same 95% of the time. So it's, it's nutrition. When we're dealing with CKD, whether you're post-transplant, pre-transplant, 
prior to dialysis at any stage of CKD, uh, I would say uh, really think about your nutrition because eventually you will have to get on a plan, some type of plan if um, if you want to if you want to be around for a while. Um, uh, Dev and Dan, I hope you're not feeling a little bit left out here as uh, some of the questions are for uh, most of the questions for Wilson, but let's keep going on. Um, so Stephanie Thompson, you had a question. Dev, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Wilson. I too found that inspiring. And, um, you know, like human beings are not rational beings. And, uh, you know, we, we just listen to the knowledge about how exercise is good. And we know that. And in looking after people with kidney disease, you know, I feel like I've had this encounter where you're trying to convince somebody what all the right things are. And, but they need to make that decision. So you describe that moment where you just, it almost sounded to like a switch flipped. But I wonder like in terms of for us, like for knowledge translation, in terms of, you know, reaching people, what are we missing? Like for you, was it totally personal or did somebody relay something to you? Or how can we actually, you know, make people want to do this? Like we just come up with saying things like exercise is medicine, which is totally yeah. unfun, totally unfun. No. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely great question. I think a lot of our talks, um, I do a lot of talks within the kidney community and there's one aspect that's missing and, and it's to your point, that question is a very good question is that a lot of times we tell folks, you need to go on a diet, you need to exercise. Here's, here's what you need to do to exercise. Here's what you can and cannot eat. Do that and you'll be fine. And it's very difficult to get, uh, to get patients to adhere. The number one thing that must precede all of this is that the patient must want it. They must want to do this. Uh, Otherwise, it's not going to work. If they're being forced, if their family's forcing them to do it, or or they they just say, "I don't want to do this, but I have to," type of deal, that is, um, you know, that type of motivation can only last so long. Um, the best way is to show patients that there is hope. To show patients what can be achieved. I get referrals from uh, my dialysis clinic. I get referrals from uh, my nephrologist. I get referrals from other nephrologists around town. And the first line of defense, what we have them do is when they refer over a patient, it's not like, all right, let's start exercising. What's your diet like? Let's take a look at all of that. What we do first is we have we sit down, we have a whole conversation. And um, I, I, I listen to the patient. I listen to see what their hopes and their dreams are. What would they want? And um, from there, we talk and I show them, especially when it's coming from a patient that's gone through it. It's, it's a, even though it's the same conversation, the same message, it is different coming from a patient or a peer versus a medical, uh, somebody in the medical field, uh, just because um, I've, I've been through it. And I'm telling them that I've been a really big guy all my life. I never exercised. I never, you know, I was, I was drinking, I was smoking, I was very unhealthy lifestyle. And for me to even be able to exercise was just an amazing thing. But here's what I tell them is that we take it step by step and they may come in and see me to work out one day on the first day. And we may just walk on the treadmill for three minutes and that's it. And it's nothing intimidating. A lot of times, and this is how I thought before was that if you were going to work out, you had to go extremely hard. You got to get to the point where you're so sore that you can't walk the next day. You got to go to the, the point you feel like you're going to cough up a lung. But I tell them, no, this is not the process that we're taking. The process that we're taking is that we just need, if all you can do is two minutes on the treadmill or two minutes of walk outside. That's all we're going to do. And we're going to keep on doing that until you're comfortable to get a little bit further. Uh, and they're okay with that. And I tell them that this is how I started. And this is where I'm at now. I show them my pictures. I show them videos. I show them, I sh pretty much try to show them the journey and it inspires hope with them. And they feel like, oh, I was active before I was on dialysis. So I, I and you know, I've had patients tell me, I was more fit than you were prior to dialysis. So if you can do it, I could probably do, do it. And, you know, all I ask them is to do is just, you know, commit for a little bit and see how it goes. And soon enough, after a few weeks, it, they build a routine. They feel confident. They feel that, oh, you know, 
I could do this actually. And when they start seeing even an ounce of results, some weight coming off, a little bit more energy. And that energy may not even be physical. It's just their, their confidence of keeping a routine, keeping discipline. And they know that this type of discipline is actually helping them on their journey to recovery. That's when they see it and it clicks. And then after, and it usually happens two to three months out, they want more and then they want more. And by the time that, you know, I tell them, you know, you, you have your goals, you want to lose 50 pounds to qualify for transplant 20 pounds or so. We know, we know that's where you need to be, but let's not look at that. What we will do is we will focus on just this week. What are you going to do this week? And then the week after that, before we start that next week, we look at what they did the previous week. Go, I want you to beat this last week, even if it's by an inch. That's it. We don't have to completely blow it out of the water. We just need you to beat it by a little bit. And oftentimes, after a few weeks of that, they choose to go from, instead of 3,000 steps to 3,001, they choose to go 5,000. And that's on them. And to see that is one of the most beautiful things when it clicks and they're like, I could do this. You lost three pounds. And if you're trying to lose 100, you lost three. That means you could lose that 100. You just need to keep on going on, uh, keep it up. And all of a sudden, they keep their head down. They do what they need to do every week. And it's been a year. And all of a sudden, they're, they're oh, wow, it's been a year. Well, let's look at your previous pictures. Let's look at you now. Let's look at your weight when you first started. Let's look at you now. Let's look at your mob mobility when you first started. And let's see your mobility now. And at that moment, they know they are getting better. And they will be inspired to be able to continue on. And, you know, as long as we can build that discipline with them, it's the discipline that carries them throughout the whole process, whether they feel good, whether they feel bad, it's the discipline that's going to uh, carry them through. And that discipline breeds a strong mindset. A strong mindset breeds discipline is just the cycle. And that's what, what we try to get everybody on. I feel Hope like that answers I your question. Now, I feel like I have to start uh, doing something right now, Wilson. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll keep going with um, for a short time, although we'll have to wrap it up fairly soon. Um, and uh, um, and I think um, I think I think the message is, you know, the step by step message. I think is a really good, you know, small steps. Um, pardon the pun, and I think that's terrific. Uh, we had a friend. Uh, we had a, a question from Ken Wyland. Ken. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. And I apologize. I got here really late. I had to teach and I missed most of that. I'll look at the, the replay on it. Um, but Wilson, yeah, this is this is for you. You brought something up when I first got on here. You were talking about uh, your nutrition. And I've been um, thinking about this for a long time, about how we you know get patients to exercise more. A lot of the patients that we, we work with on a daily basis, I, I don't know if they're actually healthy enough to, to do much until they address some of the nutritional problems they have, primarily related to chronic volume overload in, in dialysis patients. Um, so that's that's one thing, but I wanna follow up before you answer that um, or talk about that. When we're working, trying to re reduce chronic volume overload, we've got this concept of trying to liberalize the renal diet. And you hit on this a little bit, but you talked about things that you couldn't eat and when I, my reader of the literature, when I'm talking to people who have this notion of liberalizing the diet, of forgetting about, not forgetting, but really minimizing the reductions on potassium and phosphorus, um, and really focused on not eating crap processed food. And that seems to be what you were getting at is the most important. Yep. But you did mention that there were things that got you in trouble. And I, I've never worked with somebody really that has gotten in that they're eating too many fruits and vegetables, nuts, grains, legumes, and dairy. So was there actual things that you were eating that you noticed that really did get you in trouble for whether it's phosphorus, potassium levels or what have you? Oh yeah. So, so, um, you know, with regard, you know, I, I've never really had a problem with potassium for some reason it was always low. It was my phosphorus. That was a big deal. Um, you know, when I was going through this journey and walking and trying to find more efficient ways to actually lose the weight, I, I, for the, this was in 2016, 2017, it was very difficult for me to find anything with patients that were already on dialysis and to see what they were eating and to see, you know, and what, when I talked to the dietitian at the clinic, a lot of times they're more trained to say, don't eat this and don't eat it, but eat that. But I, I pulled up a lot of things online and I'm just watching it and I got in trouble for eating a lot of protein. 
I got a lot, I got in trouble for um, you know eating too much protein just because my phosphorus was up, and that that's just um, that was just me uh, uh, experimenting uh, on myself at the time. But once I found the balance of of how much protein I can eat, um, then I kind of stuck with that. Once I found out that if certain things triggered my labs to look a certain way, we would adjust it. And I would work very closely with my dietitian on it. Uh, so that that was what got me in trouble. Uh, but uh, going to the other point of, of, of talking about, you know, nutrition, that is a huge thing of it. And that's a lot of it. That is mental as well. And there's a lot of exercises that I have uh, for patients to actually do, which is, you know, we don't completely switch. Now that when I work with patients, I don't completely switch their diet. That's a recipe for failure, I feel. Um, what we often do is I have them eat normal for a week or two, track everything that they eat, and they come in and we review it. And we'll poke holes in their games and they find out that, you know, their snacks are just a little bit too much, you know, peanuts or cashews and they're overloading with that, which is causing their phosphorus to go up. Uh, we're, we're catching that, you know, they're eating too many sweets or whatever it is. Once we identify what the issues are, and then we work through that. If there's something that they uh, really like, I had uh, a lady that was uh, uh, stage four kidney disease and she was drinking 17 Cokes a day. And how we mitigated that was, okay, you can still have your Cokes, but you can only have 16. And the, you know, a few weeks later, you can only have 15. And after six months, they have given it up completely. You know, and they've tried before and they've given it up before for like a week, cold turkey. But what ends up happening is they get right back on that. And so it's, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if uh, uh, you know, the doctors uh, would uh, approve of this, but a lot of times I don't like to get them into completely cold turkey. And that's just mentally, it's, it's very tough. You can't go from eating pizza and barbecue all day to eating nothing but chicken, broccoli and rice. You have to replace replace and then eventually they get to a point where they have to clean their pantry after they clean their pantry it's very difficult for them to get snacks they would have to go to the store and now they're too lazy and you know more often than not it's you know they'll make mistakes and and you know they'll 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 falter but that's okay we'll we'll address it we'll fix it and we're looking that over time that they can adhere and if they're if we're holding their hands and we're walking them to a point where they're completely independent and doing all that that will stick so that, uh, hopefully that answers some of your, your questions. It, 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 thank you very much. That's yep. fantastic, Wilson. Um, just one last question from uh, Ty Bintran um, from Wollongong, Australia. He's asked Dev, and maybe some, maybe uh, Daniel might want to um, also push in or other people on um, how do you incorporate exercise physiologists in a renal supportive team and what are some of the barriers at the moment from this? Yeah, yeah, I can I can uh, start with that. Um, no thanks, uh, Ty Bin. Um, uh, look, um, well, two things I guess. Um, you know, there there is some data as far as you know the survey nephrologists. You know, not not asking this specific question, but particularly important to our patients, and certainly the overwhelming answer is yes. The second part of that is that you know, do they believe that um, the nephrology unit should be um, you know, uh, responsible, and and again, the overwhelming responses were, were yes. Um, and then the, the third aspect is about you know what about you know the, the team you know that that's involved in that. And I guess that's where it's a little bit murky because across the board, and, and I can't speak for you know, all units, but but exercise physiologists at, as as a part of the hospital and the public system have not have not traditionally been a part of any you know any service within the hospital. Certainly. Uh, in the outpatient setting for like rehab, cardiac rehab, respiratory rehab, for example, they, they may be, but certainly have not been. So it's that the, the issue really, what you really ask about barriers is, is, is it's the cultural one, which is that they've never been, uh, you know, uh, incorporated routinely. Um, so as far as what a nephrologist think, I mean, certainly anecdotally, I mean, I hang around to like-minded people so certainly overwhelmingly the support is that we absolutely should have exercise physiologists or exercise professionals as a part of our as our service the big barrier is cost it really is and you know we're talking in a post-covid era where you know even standard care is, is not you know able to be funded so the timing is particularly challenging across the world um but but the way we can try and mitigate that is by showing bang for buck and you know a lot of the work we're we're doing and, and indeed people around the world are showing 
in fact, Daniel presented some data about, say, um, you know, the importance of exercise and fitness in, in minimising hospitalisation. You know, at the end of the day, money talks. And so we need to, to show policymakers that by actually investing in exercise that, A, for example, we may actually get more people transplanted. You know, that's a huge, you know, getting people off dialysis, getting them transplanted, that's a big financial boon for, for the health service. Secondly, um, um, the, the, you know, if we can show that we're minimizing hospitalization by having you know, standardized exercise programs, that's a huge, huge expenditure that, that we can save as well. So it, it becomes a health economic issue, as, as sad as it is to say that. I think that is probably our greatest sort of barrier at the moment. And showing the science to, to back that um, and you know, having strong advocates, um, you know, clinicians and patients alike, I think will, will hopefully get us, get us there in due course. But, but the overwhelming support um, for, for exercise physiologists, particularly in nephrology, is, is certainly there. You just need that momentum to get us over. Thanks so much, Dev. I really uh, um, have been given the hurry up now and um, I have to close the session now. But before I go, I'd really, really like to thank um, Dan, Dev and Wilson for their great contributions. Um, and I'd also like to give a big shout out to our amazing coordinator, Emily Ford, who has uh, been the person who puts all of these together. So thank you so much, Emily. Um, in closing, I'd really like to um, look forward to seeing you in future GREX events. Watch out um, for emails and, um, and uh, web bars from Emily. And um, in that, um, everyone have a good day, a good evening, a good afternoon, a good morning, and um, best wishes from the GREX team. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.